Okay, great. So um, thanks for joining everyone. Really excited to be back here with Data Science Festival. Um, it's always uh, a great time. Um, so I wanted to talk about what can we do individually uh, and what the lar largest levers are on, on climate change. <clears throat> But not just our individual actions, also sort of thinking about the communities that we're part of, what we can do as systems and the, the systems that we're part of as well. Um, so Vijay has just done my bio, so I, I, I don't need to go over that. Um, let's start off with tech. Can tech save climate change? What is tech? So I'm going to have a fairly broad definition of what tech is and include hardware. So things like wind turbines. Um, getting larger and larger each year, but also batteries, you know, solar panels, heat pumps, smart thermostats and gadgets, electric vehicles and batteries, electric planes coming online. So all of the sort of tangible physical things that are going to characterize the next couple of decades as we completely shift all of these technology choices. And of course, alongside that, the software. So where, uh, how do you model uh, your wind turbines and how do you optimize the layout of the wind turbines to get the best um, yield? Uh, and how do you, um, you know, can you use algorithms and, and things to, to do that and to solve some of those problems automatically? Uh, how do you value a renewable energy project and how do you decide where to put it for optimal revenue? Uh, there are tools and, and software now to do that. Um, numerical weather forecasting and prediction of weather super important, um, building management and uh, how we optimize sort of data centers, as John will talk about, but even your own home, uh, energy supply to things like how you pay for your energy. So instead of paying um, a flat price, you could be paying a depending on the time of day, which is designed to get people uh, using energy, not during 5 to 7 p.m., which is sort of peak time. If you do that on Octopus's Agile tariff, you'll pay five times as much as you would otherwise. So bringing in sort of a data science approach and a technical approach to, to innovate across all of these sorts of um, parts of the parts of the economy. And then also massive companies like Zoom, which of course there's a big corona effect, but they're changing the way we, we live and the way we work. And the really exciting thing I think about tech and about massive companies like that two things is, is the scale and the speed and um, that's what we need for climate we have a couple of decades to make this enormous shift um, for the world and so we need to look at how these you know how uh, smartphones have got into the hands of you know three billion people uh, in a you know a, a decade or two that's the kind of um, pace that we need to be hitting for these climate change solutions so looking at tech and being inspired by tech taking the business models that work and applying them to greener technologies is, is the way forward, I believe. So um, in terms of levers on climate change, there's, uh, this is a tool called the 2050 Global Calculator. <clears throat> it's a little bit older now, so it's a bit less ambitious than, than some tools, but it basically takes a huge amount of different inputs and makes a, a balance sheet of what energy is being used globally. And then you have all these levers you can pull in terms of what's gonna change, how fast technology is gonna change and diffuse what we use uh, energy for and what energy sources we have in the future. And you can pull these levers and make a scenario. And you can, you can play around yourself where you can use preset scenarios that have been created by different organizations. And it gets that central sort of line chart, shows the gigatons of CO2, CO2 emissions over time. And then that it turns that into a, a range, an estimate of you know, how much climate change and how much warming we might see as the result. Um, and the challenge is to come up with pathways that actually make sense, that are feasible, that are sort of the least cost. And um, there was a recent paper uh, in Nature um, that looked at um, insights from this model. And of course, you know, the model is a model. There's many kinds of different models. And, um, you know, to some degree, the, what comes out is due to the assumptions that they've made or the way they've done it. But that all said and caveated, you know, it's... Um, these researchers found that actually um, the diet uh, was one of the biggest levers at a sort of global level in terms of meat because of land use change and agricultural emissions, but because of the huge amounts of um, uh, plant matter that is fed to, fed to feed animals. Um, and there's also all of this other stuff here in terms of um, energy technologies, improving the efficiency of fossil fuels because we're still going to use a lot in the next couple of decades. But I thought that was really interesting that the diet was such a big lever globally. And this is just to give a sort of big picture. Uh, where's the emissions coming from? Well, coal is at the top, followed closely by oil. And I think a focus on coal is important because not only is it the most polluting, but it's also the thing that we can get off the fastest. We can displace it 
with renewables and other kinds of clean generation. We can electrify all the things um, quickly. So forgive this rather complicated Sankey diagram. This is just saying there's all these different sectors in the middle. Um, this is where we use these different, uh, these, all these energy inputs and we use them for these different activities. And so I just want to go through uh, what is sort of under our control as individuals, what levers are available to us to address all of these end use activities. So roads, buildings, um, uh, livestock and agriculture and so on. So I'm going to start off with the assumption you live in, well, uh, you live in a house or you live in some sort of building. Um, it's more difficult, of course, if you're a renter or you live in a, a block of flats or something like that to have control over, you know, the fabric of a building or the technologies that's used to heat it. But nonetheless, um, in the next you know, couple of decades, homes and the, the residential housing sector needs to decarbonize, needs to go to you know, near zero. So that means insulating, it means changing your gas boiler to run on a heat pump, which hopefully will be um, using very cheap green electricity. And if you know you happen to be in that position where you own your house, you know either you're going to insulate it and change the heating system, or someone else in the future is going to. But you know it. But it sort of has to happen one way or the other. Um, also, uh, if you drive a car, again we need to decarbonise the whole transport sector. So either uh, you know you decide at some point that you're going to purchase an electric vehicle. Now plug-in hybrid is about half the emissions of a normal car. Battery electric half again. So it doesn't get you to zero. Of course, you can get rid of the car and just cycle and use public transport. And, you know, cars are incredibly useful, but I am saying this is within our control. This is a decision we have to make at some point. Um, do we sort of get on board with this transition and, and, and make a sort of purchasing decision? And of course, what we eat. Now, this isn't actually a beef burger. Uh, this is an impossible burger. So it's plant based. And again, hopefully you, if you if you try to meet the place, it's not too bad. I'm not saying you need to go vegan, but I am saying we need to decarbonize everything. And this is something that's within our control. It's within our power to change our diet, to reduce, um, and to see the benefits as well. I mean, just to go back to electric vehicles, there's a lot of evidence showing that they're much, much cheaper to run. Okay, it's a lot to buy at the moment, but um, they will actually be cheaper in the long term. So that cuts off a load of stuff. Well, what about all these other things? I don't expect us to be able to, you know, fix iron and steel production. And this is where of act not just as data scientists optimizing the, the best solutions for these other things but to be citizens and to, to vote to campaign to sort of make our voices heard as, as much as we can and to contribute to sort of industrial emissions and efficiency gains where we can but i think this is more about we need regulation we need government intervention and we need a sort of massive unified approach and of course you can campaign um here's uh, me locked to a, a big coal digger in a coal mine a few years ago um, you can join uh, Ender Galenda, this big protest in Germany about the open, um, the surface coal mines in the, the Gersweiler mine. Um, and of course, there's things like Extinction Rebellion. And I mean, I'm not saying you need to go and protest, but I'm saying we need to make our voices heard as citizens and say, this is what we want. This needs to happen. We recognize the sort of fundamental truth that this, this uh, the science is telling us that a shift needs to go ahead. And uh, we need to sort of lay the ground for that to happen. Now, there's also, so, so we're not just consumers and sort of citizens, but we also have our own creativity and our, um, you know, ingenuity. So there's loads of cool tech stuff happening around negative emissions and everyone is saying, well, we have to decarbonize this quickly. And there's some sectors that there'll still be stuff remaining, especially aviation is very difficult. We need to go below. We need to suck carbon out of the air or, or somehow sequester it to make up for that. So just a couple of companies to highlight. Um, Carbon engineering are doing direct air capture, so sucking out the carbon out of the air. Yeah, you know, how to finance that and make it and make it viable. Um, some people are thinking about how you might plant trees much, much faster and more cheaply using drones and sort of ecological experts to, to sort of create massive drones and drop seed pods um, across areas that you know were uh, good candidates for reforestation. People like Project Vesta want to take a naturally occurring mineral called olivine, dump it on beaches, and then on beaches it'll be weathered naturally and it'll sequester loads of carbon into mineral form that way. So totally, you know, very sort of out there idea, but potentially could scale massively. And that's, you know, just a creative idea they need um, support and uh, to scale up. And, and that's something I think as, as technical people, you know, we can bring our creativity and our ingenuity and our, you know, our, our power as individuals and, and put them in service of these projects that are that are going to scale up and hopefully like those tech companies that I talked about before maybe these kinds of ideas will scale up massively 
and there's a few communities I'd point you towards if, if you really uh, want to get involved further. Climateaction.tech is brilliant. Um, Luba Miller's Green Tech Alliance and uh, Open Climate Fix, uh, check them out. And I'll just end on a, a, a quote um, from Greta Thunberg. You've, you're never too small to make a difference and we have to do what's, what's in our power. Um, and together, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll solve it. So thanks very much. BJ, all yours. A whistle stop tour, Lawrence. <laughs> that was great. You covered so much. And uh, I think there's there's a lot of food for thought for the Q&A. So um, thanks a lot for that. And please do ask your, your questions in the in the Q&A, which is open now. And I forgot to mention earlier, we, we are um, engaged on Twitter at Data Science Fest, hashtag DSF, the great indoors, if you're a Twitter user. Great, Lawrence. Thanks a lot. We're going to move on to John now, John Booth. Uh, his lightning talk is titled Data Centers, Energy, Sustainability and Climate Change. John is a well-known figure in the EU data center circles, primarily for his role as reviewer for the EU Code of Conduct for Data Centers program and his work on the Certified Energy Efficiency Data Center Award, which assesses data centers against best practices. He's the chair of the Data Science Alliance, Alliance's Energy Efficiency Special Interest Group and committee member of the Sustainability Steering Group, shaping the Data Center Alliance policy on these topics, as well as providing support to the Alliance's wider activities. John is also vice chair of the BCS Green IT Specialist Group and runs his own Green IT consultancy, Carbon3 IT. Welcome, John, over to you. Thank you, VJ. Right, um, let's see, right, so here we go. <clears throat> That's me, VJ's already covered it. Oh. Okay, can we all see that now? Yeah, all good. Okay, good. So VJ's just covered that, so uh, this is a little bit more information. But uh, the question we have is, can tech save the world? And in my opinion, yes. And no. So this is a, a slide of Doggerland. So if those who don't know Doggerland, it's the area around the UK uh, that was uh, uh, there from about 16,000 years ago before the, um, the ice uh, melted away. And people used to live on Doggerbank um, and it's quite pertinent to uh, where we could be in a, in a few more slides time. But uh, what I want to do is talk about data centers. So what is a data center and, and what is the cloud? So a lot of people think that perhaps this, you know, the cloud is, is um, actually in the cloud. Which I, I, it's never failed to amaze me. Uh, and for those that are of a certain age, that is cloud based nine where Captain Scarlet and uh, Cap uh, Colonel White and the Angels used to uh, play around in the 1960s. So basically a data center is a home for digital infrastructure. So effectively all of your ICT, your mobile phones, the Zoom, banking, et cetera, is all contained within a, within a data center somewhere. So they're a home for servers, network, and storage. There is an electrical system to provide electrical energy. There's a cooling system. There's uninterruptible power supplies and generators. There's telecommunications network and cabling systems. There's also building integrity systems, so fire, very early smoke detection apparatus, fire suppression systems, security and access control. And then to wrap it up, there's the social uh, policies, processes and procedures that, uh, that manage the data center. And this is what they kind of look like. But at the heart of a data center, it is to deliver digital services to internal and external customers at the lowest possible cost based on your risk profile. Now, what I want to do now is look at some uh, data center energy and environmental impact. So in the UK, commercial data centers account for about 0.8% of our energy use. But there is the hidden energy use, which is all of the server rooms and uh, enterprise type data centers that are in use all across the UK, including mobile phone towers, railway signaling systems, and that's actually 12%. But 
there is a, a UK energy gap that's fast approaching. And part of that is that 14 gigawatts of generation capacity will be decommissioned by 2032. And that's um, quite an alarming. That's about a third of our generation capacity. Of course, this aligns with our UK net zero ambitions, but currently we're importing 10% of our energy via interconnectors from, uh, from Europe. And of course, we've got some potential issues with uh, Brexit. So that's just on the energy side of things for data centers. And on the environmental side of things, we've got ICT embodied energy. So this is um, all of the components, minerals that are used in the manufacture of IT, uh, which is then transported around the world, assembled, and then uh, given to us end users. There is also an impact on rare earths. Um, so these are the components that we, we don't necessarily, they're not day-to-day -day components, but they're often mined via artisanal mining um, using child labor, uh, sometimes known as conflict minerals. Then we've got the potential of uh, e-waste, on the human health and also on soil contamination. So this is why I said at the beginning that the tech can tech save the world. Yes, it can, because you know there is a six times multiplier on the use of technology to improve environmental aspects and energy consumption elsewhere within the supply chain in government and academia and commercial. But it comes at a cost, and that cost is normally borne by the developing world. And I don't think this is something that is uh, viable or sustainable. Okay, so just to highlight that for, and this data is quite old, it's from uh, 2003, I think. But for one PC, we're looking at 240 kilograms of fossil fuels in the manufacture, 21 pounds of chemicals, 1500 litres of water. And in 2009, over three point uh, three, just over three point three hundred and fifty million PCs manufactured. It might be tablets, but they're even worse. Um, in effect, the amount of fossil fuels used in computing to that date, two thousand and nine, would power the Drax power station for for two thousand four hundred years. And at the time, Drax accounted for 7% of UK generation. Now it's only about 0.5%. So that's a big problem, I think, and we're failing to deal with that. Now, this is a screenshot from flood.firetree.net. And as you can see, it shows a seven metre rise in sea level. As you can see, most of the Netherlands disappears under the waves. And if we were to zoom in, London, we can set at seven meters again. We can see that all those data centers in Docklands are in effect underwater, and you will need a boat to get to them. Worse for Amsterdam, though, uh, as we can see, most of the city will be underwater apart from a little bit at the center uh, where the canal areas are. And moving forward, so this is 60 meter sea level rise, and um, as you can see, the effects are far, far worse. And where I live in Warwick, right now we're 80 miles away from the sea. If sea levels rise by 60 meters, Warwick becomes a beach resort. And why is this a problem? It's a problem because a lot of the European connectivity is based in London and Amsterdam. And of course, seven meter rise is going to affect uh, to definitely European communications, potentially global communications as well. So that's kind of a much enough doom. So what can your organizations do to mitigate your data center energy consumption and potentially ICT energy consumption as well? So ICT manufacturers really do need to get to, up to grips with, um, with how much energy they're using for their manufacture, but also the energy that the servers are using when they're in use. Software guys need to develop energy aware software. Data and ICT architects of systems need to be energy and sustainability aware. Data center designers need to make data centers that are energy efficient, energy flexible, that means they're sharing their uh, energy use, and they need to be able to use that waste heat that we've been 
we generate. In the data center supply chain, they need to develop energy efficient and sustainable products and equipment. And they need, everybody needs to calculate and publish their scope three emissions. The best mitigation access though is to use the EU code of conduct for data centers and energy efficiency with 160 plus best practices which if used correctly can provide a real strategic and cultural change within your organization. And we also, the ICT community globally needs to come together to develop and implement a global data center sustainability standard. Now, there are some other elements. So we've got the EU code of conduct. Uh, there are standards relating to data centers from CENT and ECETI, which is the European Standards Organization. There is ISO uh, data center standards as well. Um, and then of course, we've got the EU funded uh, projects such as the Buden type one and the Catalyst project show the way for lean and green facilities. And in Catalyst's case, development of marketplace where energy flexibility with T and IT uh, can be used on a, on a kind of trading platform. Very, very good system. And I would love you to go and visit. So conclusion, climate change will possibly lead to sea level rise. There is an ICT materials impact. Um, data centers and telecommunications networks have an embodied energy and impact for both mechanical, electrical and the construction. There is embodied energy in the ICT. There is energy uh, that we're using in data centers, telco networks, e-waste, and in conclusion, tech can save humanity but with some planet. So over back to you, Vijay. Thanks a lot, John. That was very interesting. Certainly not a topic that I personally know a lot about. So um, learned a lot. And I should say to the speakers so far, you're keeping the time fantastically well. Let's, uh, let's keep that up because we've got lots of questions coming in, keep them coming. And we will go to our next speaker now, which is, Lubomila Jordanova, and her uh, title is Plan A's Data-Driven Approach in Supporting Decarbonization Efforts in Companies. So Lubomila is the founder and CEO of Plan A Earth, a Berlin-based startup develop developing an algorithm which predicts where and how climate change will hit the hardest, and a SaaS platform that helps businesses calculate, monitor, and reduce their emissions. She also recently founded the Green Tech Alliance, a community of 300 plus startups, which are connected to over 200 advisors from VC, that's venture capital, media and business, who help them with advice and feedback. Prior to Plan A, she worked in investment banking, venture capital and fintech in Asia and Europe. She was recent, recently announced as Marshall Fund Fellow for 2021 and 30 under 30 social entrepreneur for 2020 by Forbes, and entrepreneur to watch in Germany. Congratulations, Luba. Over to you. Thank you so much. Actually, since the time when I uh, submitted the bio, there's 500 startups in the Green Tech Alliance and 350 advisors. So uh, just a little update. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. This is so insightful already and the whole festival has been fantastic. Uh, all these incredible contributions uh, and now I'm going to share a bit more um, about the data-driven approach of Plan A, but most importantly about why we think tech needs additional attributes for it to be successfully implemented in the fight against climate change. Um, so let's kick it off. So how can science, tech and collaboration address climate change? Uh, my journey started in 2017 uh, on a beach like this. I was supposed to be surfing in Morocco. Instead, I ended up cleaning beaches uh, and kind of seeing all these evidences of human existence on a daily basis that were showing a lot of disrespect for nature. On the first day of my journey there, um, instead of being in the water, what I ended up doing was in my shock by seeing on the most famous beach in Agadir, um, I ended up collecting a lot of trash. That was just the collection from one hour, uh, pairs of shoes, a lot of burnt plastic, glass bottles. 
and all these little uh, evidences, pieces of human existence. At that point of time, my knowledge about climate change was as big as this dot on the screen. I kind of had, of course, a notion of pollution. I had an idea about how there's a correlation between human existence and the changes in our climate, but wasn't particularly clear on how my day-to-day -day was impacting every single aspect of our climate changing. Um, I ended up doing what we all do quite often. Uh, I decided to educate myself about the topic. Um, I read a lot of books, uh, listened to a lot of podcasts, also subscribed to some pop culture magazines, watch videos, TED Talks, and uh, all these wonderful pieces of information that we can find quite easily online. What was quite shocking, or I could say uh, unexpected, was that First of all, there was a lot of agreement about where we were standing on the topic of climate change. But there was also three emerging teams that were coming up every single time I was going through even scientific papers. Um, and there were these. First of all, uh, there was a lot of evidence that was coming from business and also from successfully implemented research projects that businesses had a role to play in uh, addressing climate change. Uh, it was mentioned also by Lawrence that there's a lot of different aspects that can be changed with regards to agriculture, with regards to production, uh, and also statistics uh, historically have been able to prove this as well. The second aspect was the fact that climate change science was the source of knowledge, but also of solutions. It was not only there to sit as facts uh, or as random statistics or someone's PhD uh, results, it was actually there to contribute to a bigger picture with regards to what we needed to do in order to address this big threat ahead of us. And finally, the aspect that I care a lot about and is also implemented in the way we think in Plan A about sustainability is the need for a collaborative approach. What does this mean? Well, as we face all these challenges that are in a collection, the result uh, uh, or kind of the, the, the reason for climate change, uh, we can't expect that a single stakeholder is going to be able to address them. So hence the collaborative approach. So what is the equation of success if we want to bring a healthy planet back? Um, in our minds, it was the combination of these three aspects, but uh, to allow for you to also test it for yourself, let's go through a few examples that maybe can lead you to think this as well. The lesson number one from our perspective is with regards to science. Uh, the first evidence actually about uh, the fact that the coal industry was impacting our climate and was changing uh, how our uh, uh, climate was looking came from a Swedish uh, chemist, Svante Arrhenius, uh, who in 1986 essentially mentioned that there's something uh, wrong. Uh, sorry, 18, uh, 1886. Uh, <laughs> It went like for a long, long time uh, for us to kind of collect a lot of data and see through this data that there's a lot of understanding that is sitting on the same kind of side of the table with regards to where these temperature anom anomalies were coming from. Um, these are all reputable institutes. And if someone is questioning whether scientists are arguing on daily basis about climate change, uh, this maybe is an evidence that it's not always the case. So it's quite often not the case. The results of this evidence have already been visible. Uh, there's been enough stories that have been told about how the temperatures of this, the oceans are going to be rising and the capacity of the ocean to actually um, uh, to actually take care of climate change uh, as it has been doing for decades uh, is reducing in uh, due to the fact that there's significant plastic pollution. Um, other things that also have been uh, predicted and unfortunately now we see them uh, on day-to-day -day basis is the increased occurrence of uh, natural disasters. Yes, we've always had natural disasters. This is not caused by climate change, but the speed with which they uh, show up and also the frequency has increased significantly. This is actually a visual from The Guardian actually a few days ago from the unfortunate Hurricane Yota uh, in Honduras. This is another recent uh, example of, uh, of something that is happening on a day-to-day basis and also has been spoken about a lot by science with regards to like how the overpopulation of cities is also leading to increased speed of development with regards to climate change. 
uh, this is uh, this is California, uh, and this is a state where uh, pollution and also uh, traffic jams are quite of a common uh, quite of a common sight. Lesson number two, uh, this is technology. Now I'm gonna turn to planning uh, because this is what I know and uh, my non-scientific perspective has uh, allowed me also to kind of develop uh, these products that I'm gonna present uh, together with the help of a lot of scientists and a lot of technology experts. We have a software that enables companies to calculate, monitor and reduce their emissions. Uh, the software automates the process of collection of data related to climate change uh, and emissions, sustainability, water management, plastic consumption and so on. Uh, today, navigate the company on how they can reduce these emissions. Uh, we cover scope one, two and three and the three is covered by proprietary calculators that are developed for the particular case of the company. As many of you might know, uh, scope three is kind of where the secret of emissions is hiding. 90% uh, of emissions of Volkswagen, for example, are sitting within scope three. We've already served more than three, 200 businesses in all sorts of fields and all sorts of geographies. The second product that we've developed is an algorithm that is able to predict where and how climate change will hit the hardest. This is the result of an analysis of over uh, 300,000 data points coming from all these different sources and these different national, but also uh, well-renowned international institutions. For all of this work, we've analyzed 305,000 data points related to oceans, forests, wildlife, sustainable living, sustainable energy and waste management. We've developed over 100 calculators and also worked with 150 scientists uh, and a community of 100,000 members. The final aspect and something that uh, regardless of how much science and technology we have is in my opinion, the key to address climate change effectively is collaboration. These are a few examples that I'm gonna show with regards to what we have done to support the local communities in Berlin to start thinking about climate change as something that they hold responsibility for. First of all, this is a cleanup. As you can see, we've collected a lot of trash, different, uh, uh, bottle caps, uh, cigarette butts, bicycles, anything you can see. And this is a company that normally works in the food uh, sector. Um, these were three hours where these teams essentially uh, of volunteers gathered uh, to spend some time doing something that goes outside of the spectrum of their day to day. This is another event that we organize that is uh, the pub quiz where we teach people about climate change in a more informal manner. Um, where they can drink a beer, but then also donate uh, with their tickets money to environmental causes. Finally, this is a panel that is with fantastic experts on mobility, uh, also representatives of the Green Party in Berlin, um, and also people from the government that were engaging hundred and something people on how they can become better citizens by actually impacting a better mobility standard and behavior within the city. This is another cleanup and uh, it's one that gathered 700 people in Tripto Park in Berlin uh, with the help of a lot of different companies. We've organized over 60 events and we've had 15,000 visitors uh, plus 100 partners. The final aspect that is really important to my story is with regards to the Green Tech Alliance. Thank you, Lawrence, for mentioning it. Uh, we launched it in May 2020 in the beginning of COVID or kind of lockdown number one. Uh, we already have 500 members, uh, 350 advisors and 10 partner organizations. Any green tech startup is invited, any scientist is invited and anyone that really is looking for a job and maybe doesn't have a, a lot of knowledge about the topic is also welcome to knock on our door. So the year is 2020 and I'm probably a bit over time. My knowledge has expanded significantly, uh, but it's only the result of the knowledge of others that we've been able to see the progress that we need in order for climate change to be addressed. Thank you so much. Uh, and there's no plan B for the planet. Thanks a lot, Luba. I think everyone is gonna remember plan A after that. And um, really good to hear about the, the, the work that you're doing. So we're gonna move on to our final speaker, which is uh, Brittany, Brittany Salas. Um, she is talking about leveraging data for eco-conscious behavior change. And then we'll be moving on to, to a Q&A. Keep those questions coming. We've got loads and we'll be um, we'll hopefully be going through most of those after this talk. So Brittany is a native Californian and yogi. 
and is passionate about the integration of individual health and well-being into environmental sustainability. Prior to active giving, she established Plug and Play's European Sustainability Programme, supporting venture capital funds and innovation departments in their search for investment opportunities. She's been active in the clean tech startup ecosystem since 2015, where she began her work at a smart city consultancy in New York City. As a result of a master's in global energy policy from New York University and a bachelor's in international political economy, Brittany became fascinated with the interlinking of economics and environmental sustainability, a fascination which is, has evolved into her current venture, which she is going to tell us about. Over to you. Yeah, awesome, DJ. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it was also great to hear from the other speakers as well and, and get a good understanding of the impacts of climate change. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and in this process, invite everyone to take a deep breath, close your eyes. And now maybe center in a bit. You've heard a lot of facts. We have a lot of information flowing around in our head at the moment and shift to a different perspective, one of individual well-being. So let's take a chance to think about a time when we did something nice, either for somebody else or maybe ourselves. Maybe it was holding the door open or picking up a piece of trash on the sidewalk. Now with this, hold that feeling in mind. Maybe it was very subtle, very small, but just try to remember it for a second. Now we can open our eyes, exhale, and think about a much bigger problem, one that was laid out for us by our other speakers. So we know based on the evidence that climate change is here. And now when we put this into perspective of that feeling we had a bit earlier, it may seem like that comparison uh, one dwarfs the other. However, the two are really inextricably linked as we as individuals are part of a system. And active giving is really on a mission to clearly communicate everyone's individual role within the climate crisis in order to have a larger systemic effect on policy or let's say even organizations that contribute to a lot of the emissions that are currently um, being released. So we're st starting specifically uh, with different, a different niche group of individuals. And this is everyone who likes sports, which is why the introduction of, of me being a yogi was so important. Um, so anyone who basically likes to run, walk, go for bike rides can now leverage that activity in order to make more of an eco-conscious decision and contribute to the environment. Um, and how is that done? So it's done with active giving. Basically what it is, is a fitness app that allows anyone to turn their calories burnt or kilometers covered into trees planted in global reforestation projects. And this is done uh, by tracking your fitness activities and also uh, through partnerships with different tree planting organizations, which I'll get into a bit later. Um, so the idea here is really to use um, technology that does already exist in terms of tracking our behavior. Um, so anyone who uses a fitness tracker can understand that you know everything from the time you wake up in the morning uh, to the calories that you burn during your workout um, can really be used to provide a more holistic picture of our actions and how we choose to um, behave throughout the day. And really leveraging that for eco-consciousness and a sense of personal well-being is what active giving is on a mission to do. So right now we're starting with health and fitness, but you know this can also lead into uh, different areas of your daily life, like your energy use, um, water use, transportation, all of which can create this profile that can then be used by anyone to understand how to um, make more sustainable decisions on a daily basis. So one use case that we have of, a, of an earlier collaboration with is with an organization called HOKA. So they committed about 10,000 euros in order to reach a different users um, on our app and not 10 euros, 10,000 euros, as you can see on the slide there. And through that, um, you know, we were able to award about 70, 74 different bicycles um, to rural healthcare worker students and entrepreneurs all across um, different parts of Africa and really connect this feeling of taking care of oneself with doing good. 
more specifically uh, within environmental sustainability, uh, we have a collaboration with the Green Party um, and with an organization called Ecoligo. So Ecoligo is a company that actually contributes or is a crowdfunding website that allows anyone to invest in um, social and environmental projects. And um, we were able to allow them to sponsor a specific uh, running group uh, that is the Green Runners themselves. And they've been going, I think they're up to almost 20,000 trees now um, that they've planted as a result of a continuous collaboration. So the way it works is that every time they go for a run, they track their activities and then uh, make a donation uh, to an organization. So one of the tree planting projects on board called Trees for the Future. And then all of the runners actually match those donations that Ecoligo is providing as well. Some of the platform projects that we work with, um, they have a different variety of nature-based solutions. So Trees for the Future, for instance, uh, they take a permaculture approach to tree planting. So they're working with different farmers um, and basically enabling them to use the forest garden approach, basically planting trees around their crops to increase crop yields and secure a stronger livelihood for them and also fight desertification. We have Eden Reforestation Projects, which focuses heavily on uh, job creation. So they're working within specific countries to employ as many people as possible um, and use reforestation as methodology for that. WWF, I'm sure you've all heard of, World Bicycle Relief, I mentioned a bit earlier. Green City Solutions are also one of my favorites. Um, I personally like them because they do take a, a clean tech approach. Um, they have developed a city tree which cleans uh, urban air and focuses particularly on ozone and uh, particulates as well in the air. And it's basically like this three foot or three meter by three meter box of moss, which is really cool um, and filters the local air quality in the surrounding area. And then we also have We Forest on board and we're working with our Brazil project uh, in the Atlantic Forest. And they take a highly scientific approach to reforestation, focusing first on preserving existing forests, and then from there, um, creating corridors between two areas of a forest that have been um, kind of destroyed by agriculture use in order to really restore the local ecosystem and create a space for the local habitat, both plant and animal, to, to regenerate. So those are the projects we have on board. And as you can see, the time for eco-conscious action is now, whether it be through this personal motivation of understanding that the world just isn't gonna be the same as it was uh, when we were growing up. And if we hope to preserve that, uh, we really do need to change our behavior. And both the individual and different organizations um, and investment funds are actually starting to realize this, whether it be the increase in um, you know, sales of sustainability products, as you can see, we have 114 billion in sales. So organizations have come to see that there is not only a you know, necessary uh, decision that needs to be made, but also yeah, a profit that can be made from focusing on something good, which is, is the truth. And then we have different investment funds. So we have a total of about 933 billion, according to Morningstar, that has been invested into environmental and social governance indexes. So really the, the ecosystem people are starting to move and it's time for us all to, to get engaged, both on the individual and organizational level. Um, so that, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you guys. Going to... Excellent. Thanks very much, Brittany. Well, great to hear about your work as well. And I'd like to invite all the panelists back into the room, the digital room. And we've only got John for, I think, five minutes. So I'm going to start this Q&A with a question for, for John, um, if he returns. Yes, he is. Okay, so we're just going to start with something for you. I think it's a great question from Zoe. And um, it's specifically for you. And this is who, who in an organization should be responsible for checking the tech carbon footprint? Is it the CTO, HR people, or, or somebody else? It's, it's definitely, um, but he's going to have to get triggered by. Could, could you just repeat that, John? Because your audio cut out just for a second. We missed your answer. It, it should be the CTO, but he will probably get. Um, triggered by the executive board and the reason for that is is that um, very recently the government passed the streamlined energy and carbon reporting regulations which means that all aspects of a, an organization's energy has to be covered and that's a board level and there are some quite significant penalties for failure to report 
So the board will be telling the CTO that he needs to provide uh, energy data for all of the ICT aspects within the organization. Okay, thank you very much. And there was another question from Joe. Um, this is to, to all, the, all the speakers, but uh, maybe also, also for John. Um, are there other things that, that we, we should be advising people in tech to avoid doing? Are there things that actually aren't useful and are better, on, better off doing manually or through other processes or, or just duplicate something that works pretty well already? Uh, well, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, what I would suggest is, is that there are a number of best practices within the EU Code of Conduct that talk about auditing your organization's IT stack. One thing that we found is, is that whenever there's a migration project and somebody moves to a new hardware platform or upgrades to a new software stack, what you'll find is, is that they'll migrate everything over to the new stack everything will work okay, but nobody will ever turn off the old servers, fearing that if there's a problem with the new stack and the new uh, software application, that they won't be able to recover and revert back to the original system. Now, over time, within a project, there should be an element, which is the completion part of the project that says, have you removed all of the servers that, are in, that were originally there? But sometimes what happens is people close projects down too quickly and staff get reassigned to other projects. And what you'll end up with, you go back into the data center a year later and there'll be a whole load of equipment in a rack, which incidentally costs about 14,000 pounds a year to run for one server, just sitting there idle. So my, if I've got one takeaway, it would be use the EU Code of Conduct for data centers energy efficiency. There's 160 best practices in there. Do the audit inside of things and get rid of those servers that have been stored away, tucked away, gathering dust, um, which are no longer needed by the business and get them out. Thanks a lot for that, John. Okay, we're gonna change the theme slightly a bit. And uh, we have a question here very interesting question from Constance. And we've heard these different, this is to all the panelists, we've heard different examples of how, how data is being used or can be used in the, in the case of Lawrence, who gave a very broad overview. Um, are there things that we're still missing when it comes to using technical innovations um, to mitigate climate change? We talked about weather data, uh, John mentioned uh, very, various things around, around energy usage in data centers as well. Um, there are many examples that, we, that have been brought up, but are there things that, what's coming around uh, across the horizon? What's next? What's still missing? Who would like to take that one? Maybe I can take it. Absolutely. Uh, it's a fantastic question. And I think uh, the answer may be a bit surprising. I think we should stop seeking yet uh, the next uh, innovation. We have all the innovations, or at least a huge amount of them already sitting on the table and available to us actually to utilize them and by implementing them essentially address climate change. I think what is missing definitely is a kind of additive approach to technology. Uh, there's a lot of innovation that doesn't fit to the existing system that we have. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I don't know how people perceive it, uh, we have been building and developing this system quite well. You know, there's a lot of innovation that has been applied and now is used like widely by governments and um, by different stakeholders. Um, we need to understand that adaptability of these technologies needs to be applied to the existing systems that we have and not just mindlessly continue to create a lot of more uh, novelty. Uh, I think we need to be a bit more understanding with ourselves and how society moves uh, and that your advancement on a certain level doesn't necessarily mean that the whole, uh, uh, the whole humanity is gonna jump on, on this idea. Maybe it's a bit more philosophical, but mm -hmm. what I mean by that is that um, innovation doesn't catch up as quickly as we want and we need to adapt ourselves to the system that we have to yeah. make big leaps in fighting climate change. And it's also possible to be ahead of the curve sometimes. 
you can you can make things and you know i'm sure we've all been in that position where you that you think is the best thing since sliced bread and nobody's ready for it and if it's not if it's not actually um if you can't implement it then it's uh, it's a big waste of time um do you have anything specific in mind when you when you put that point across or is it just a general point I think there's a lot that I can uh, uh, give as examples where um, we even see it in the Green Tech Alliance, like phenomenal inno innovations in terms of, uh, for example, food substitute and so on. Like maybe that's not the best example, but like uh, products that are totally not applicable to the regulatory framework, for example, in Germany that are developed in Germany. And um, it, it's just like alignment to existing stakeholders. Uh, off-grid systems are still uh, uh, an innovation that is could discussed a lot, but still is not necessarily applied widely. And uh, quite often it's visible in places where it should be visible more or anywhere, but it's it's not. So I, I don't know how to explain better that the regulatory framework is something that doesn't necessarily always catch up with innovation. So we need to align basically uh, ourselves to it to see our innovation applied today rather than 20 years. I see Lawrence and, and nodding. Understood. Do, do any, of the other, any of the other panelists have uh, anything they'd like to add to that? Yeah, um, so I completely agree with Uba Mila. It's the technology and a lot of it that we actually really need to impact changes there, it exists. Um, but I think one thing that's, that's really key is the ability to scale it. And so when we put everything into perspective, just with emissions, for instance, we have about, I think, 6.4 gigatons. It's going to be released with business as usual, according to um, the IEA within the energy sector alone. So to put that into perspective, we have one metric trend that's released on a flight from LA uh, to London. So we got a lot of work to do. And I think there's about, I think the IEA also estimates 2.4 trillion that needs to be invested into the energy sector alone to help abate those emissions. Um, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and I think the, the objective right now is to invest in the technologies that exist in order to get them to a point of scale um, where that those emissions can actually be mitigated. And for that to happen, it means collaboration um, that we've been talking about earlier within an entire organization. So this is not just a C-level decision. Um, it's the people who will be carrying out the work on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that be someone who's you know, ensuring that their business unit needs to operate more efficiently um, or a C-level executive who needs to meet those emissions targets. And so really having this buy-in from every single level within an organization, um, I think is definitely what's needed to invest into the technology that already exists and that will help mitigate the climate crisis. Yeah, it's an, a, certainly an interesting balancing act. Um, I can definitely see where you two are coming from. Um, I would just like to give one example, which is, let's take the example of wind turbines. If, uh, in, and I'll give the example of the UK, if we had decided to freeze technical advancements five years ago, we would be using wind turbines that are about 30% less um, smaller than the ones that we can use this year. So there, there are these kind of incremental um, changes to be made in, in some regards, but then the point is completely taken that scale is what we, is what we absolutely need. Um, I think Lawrence wants to jump in. <laughs> yeah, I just was thinking, you, you know, there's a thing about sort of imagination and creativity, which I kind of talked about as well, in the sense that, um, you know, in some ways, we think that these technologies should be like directly replaceable and just slot in and everything in terms of the system will be the same, but instead of a coal power station, it will be a wind farm. And of course, it's not really gonna be like that. And the way that we're thinking about how uh, internet is, is spread around the world in, you know, coming from satellites or direct, uh, rather than, you know, having to have a, a cell phone network or having microgrids with renewables. I think there's lots of ways where the new technology yeah, will leapfrog problem will be drastically different or it could be drastically different and that that's sort of hard to predict and hard to to think about but it's sort of an imagination problem as, as to sort of work out you know what could be truly different hmm. interesting well i'm gonna i'm gonna move it on uh, because we have lots of questions and we're gonna go to a question from ragav and this is for all of you how can i contribute to climate change mitigation he says to climate change. I think we read to climate change mitigation as a data scientist. Are there open community-based data science projects that I can contribute to? Can I start? Absolutely. 
so we work together with Yale, uh, and there's the Yale Open Lab project where you can uh, become a contributor. Like uh, there's a, a hackathon that happens in more than uh, I would say 50 cities. Uh, Berlin is one of them. Uh, we were a partner uh, this year and last year. Um, and it's really fantastic because it's collaboraton. Uh, so anyone from anywhere in the world can actually contribute. Uh, this is one example that I think is really fantastic and I can um, definitely confirm that uh, they're thinking of how fundamentally to change the way we live in a positive way. So it's really a great positive project. Thanks a lot. Any, um, anything else? Yeah, so the, the, one of the organizations I mentioned, climateaction.tech, um, does a lot of like organizing and working out how to bring tech sector workers in and to, to educate and self-organize and collaborate on climate. Um, they also, I don't know exactly how it's related, but there's an org called workonclimate.org, uh, workonclimate.org. And they will like channel you towards volunteering opportunities um, to like put you uh, towards doing useful projects. And uh, as, as Libby said, yeah, like hackathons and sort of, Things that are publicly advertised to sort of use your skills in, in sort of service of climate solutions. So there are, there are stuff out there. Uh, yeah, work on climate.org is, is a good one. And are there are there specific university courses or or any any academic academic routes that you can recommend to the listeners? Yeah, so I did I did a um, a master's uh, a brand new master's two years ago at UCL called Energy Systems and Data Analytics, um, which was specifically about like data science for climate and energy, and so bringing to bear all the kind of optimization and machine learning and and fun stuff, you know, but more about energy sector applications. And I really enjoyed that. I met uh, a lot of good people that I now work with, and that's in its third year. Uh, I can only really speak to the UK stuff, but Imperial has an Environmental Technologies Masters as well. That's also really well regarded. We're going to be um, launching at the, yeah, sorry, go, go, Brittany. I was going to say, there's also a really good um, online community called Climate Change AI. Um, it's as explanatory as it sounds. And there's, you know, a lot of different research reports and collaborations that come out there and people looking for postdocs all the way up to um, job post posts. So I find that to be a really nice community. Um, we're also looking to build our founding team in the US. So if anyone is interested, um, please reach out to me and learning more about, uh, I guess, our overall vision that we have for launching in, in the US. Lugo, did you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to say that we're going to be launching in the next few months a course on green tech, uh, together with uh, in partnership with a few universities in Germany, where uh, it's going to be an online course where basically we just want to give people the perspective of what does actually green tech stand for, uh, with the help of a lot of scientists. So if anyone is interested in either contributing or being part of the building process, get in touch because we're now setting the foundation. There's an invitation. Okay, um, we're going to take a couple of questions that, that are more on um, the climate change side of things rather than the tech side. Uh, there's one which I think is a fascinating topic, which is from Etha, I hope I pronounced the name right, uh, which is about overpopulation. So all of the impacts, this is a question, we, all the impacts we've identified here are to do with human existence, meat, consumption of oil, land, et cetera, but they're not proportionally distributed. For example, a family of two in the developed world has a 282 times bigger carbon footprint than the same family in the developing world. That's his stat, I can't verify that. Um, is overpopulation the problem or is consumption and production of stuff the problem? That's a big question, but uh, you know, I think it's a super interesting one, especially as we head towards these um, you could say quite scary, but certainly um, impressive uh, population uh, estimates, which is 10 billion by the end of 20, 21st century. Yeah, it's, it's a good, I mean, uh, William Gibson has that quote, the future is here, it's just not. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, but it, this this question is good because it brings in the real uh, a real question of like justice and equity and, and fairness and 
who has produced most of the emissions uh, so far in the world, which is you know the, the global north or developed countries, and who now uh, are being told that they can't develop or they can't build coal plants that they want to build, like India is still building coal plants, and international communities saying no, you must stop and do something else. And I think the challenge for uh, the world is to provide development pathways that are clean and and fair, so that developed country should bear more of the cost and should should do more and part of that is recognizing their historical responsibilities um, and also providing technology to to uh, enable people to grow and prosper and build their own economies but in a in a clean and, and kind of way so yeah i think it's definitely distribution i don't think it, i don't really like their overpopulation about it i think you know we, the earth can support billions of people if we do it right Luca. I would fully agree with Lawrence. I think uh, it was also mentioned by John. Uh, we actually have an incredibly unstable infrastructure. The way our cities are built, the way our kind of growth has been uh, setting itself on the fields that uh, we live on uh, does not support the growth that we're going to observe in the coming decades. And I think this is the main challenge um, on uh, from a climate change perspective, because we just don't know how to support ourselves to make sure that everyone is safe and secure. Overconsumption uh, is a massive issue that further contributes to climate change and is one that uh, should not be disregarded in conjunction with infrastructure. Um, but I would say uh, having built cities that are capable of securing uh, better uh, Better, bigger populations is what we need. There's fantastic books about this. I'm going to put them in the chat. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, Brittany, do you have anything you'd like to add there or should we move on? No, I'm, I mean, I completely agree. It's just a matter of managing our resources um, in a way that is fair and distributed, and ensuring that you know those who are affected by climate change right now are not the most vulnerable communities that have the least amount of resources to deal with it. So. And um, as, as a Californian, can we trust that you'll be leading the way? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We gotta. We have some few wildfires, so we're going to be needing to plant many trees. Um, that's for sure. Uh, but I think, yeah, that, that bringing in that personal understanding of, of how our daily lives are impacted, or for me, you know, like seeing mountains change, ski seasons get shorter, uh, Luba Mila going to the beach and not being able to go in it without getting sick in the water. Um, these are all, you know, how we can feel these effects on a, on a daily basis and understand that we have a role to play. Um, and it really is through changing our behavior and affecting our larger organizations that we can live, work collaboratively to ensure that we have a future that we all want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, just following on from that, the, with a, a question from Peter, um, which is somewhat connected. He notes that China contributes 27% of the of the, the world's CO2 emissions equivalent. Um, so his question is, are, and I'm going to use his phrasing, are we just tackling, are we just polishing the bucket that we use to control the tsunami? And just two words of uh, from my perspective is that I really feel like um, we cannot use those lines anymore about China and India and whatnot, because actually all countries are, are making huge strides and pledges at the moment. So uh, perspectives from the, from the panel appreciated, please. One thing that is always really scary when we blame one single country is the fact that we forget that we're so globally connected. Uh, Unfortunately, Paris Agreement targets have been set for the boundaries of a single country, which means that Germany is only responsible for what's sitting within its own boundaries. But all the orders that have come from the automotive sector that have been sent to China and the emissions that have been created because of that are not calculated for that. So I don't know if it's really appropriate to like blame it on China. I guess China has taken an economical approach of growth taken 200 million people out of poverty, which is fantastic. Uh, and given a lot of, I would say, uh, opportunity for too many, uh, India is uh, a country that is facing probably the big, at least from, from what I know from another fantastic book, uh, um, on a, on what not unlivable earth, uh, I'll think of the name uh, anyways. But basically there's a, uh, I think we need to think of 
to distribute the responsibility across uh, geographies and across stakeholders. Everyone is responsible, uh, everyone takes flights, everyone goes to different places uh, and blaming it on China at the end of the day just doesn't work in my opinion. And I think it was China that actually has a net zero goal set out by 2060. So as a national approach. Um, so there are there is a lot of progress being made, whether it be also like in renewables um, and increasing their share of renewable energy. Um, yes, of course, everyone is, is still building out coal, um, but that's something, you know, Europe and the US are doing as well. So, I mean, it is as just to echo that a, a collaborative approach. Uh, Lawrence, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think if you, uh, our world in data, which I often go to for these sources because they do such a good job of putting the data sources together, I think shows EU and Russia, US and China and India are all about equal in terms of historical um, emissions, like some total. So, uh, yeah, is it useful or constructive to sort of say to some countries to go faster than others or they should do more like... Um, I think to some extent, yes. Like the, the the amazing thing about the Paris Climate Agreement was that it even existed, right? I mean, that it, um, the, the UN discussions, uh, the fact that even the smallest countries can be in the same room with the biggest countries and everyone can say their piece, I think is, is kind of an amazing thing. Um, and that was the first step that was what was needed. It took almost you know, 40 years from like 19, 1980s where they had the first Earth Summit to, to then agreeing we're gonna actually you know, globally um, sort this out together. Um, and yeah, it's right that countries put pressure on other countries and say, we should do more, we should go faster. Um, and I think China, yeah, is saying, well, why should we go faster when you guys have, have done so much historically? And so it's a bit of a, you know, there's a lot of geopolitics and power struggles as, as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's that constructive to, to blame, I guess. But I think when you look at countries and they are so, I mean, Europe is actually an amazing uh, just on coal, um, Europe is, you know, most European countries have phased out coal really quickly. America, it's starting to go more and more quickly as well. And so when you see some countries saying, oh, we're still going to keep financing these projects, then I think it's fair to say, look, you know, you've got to stop this now because there is a much better way. And then likewise, in some ways, they are, China is saying, well, we have all these environmental targets that some, that are, you know, America just left the Paris Climate Accord. Now it's coming back. But, you know, from China's perspective, they're saying we're not the only people, you know, who are going to prioritize ourselves here. You know, so yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, from a personal perspective, I think um, I feel a sense of um, excitement about about the direction that we're going in for the first time in a long time. Um, the the next conference of the parties, the big conference that will happen in Glasgow, um, which got delayed unfortunately because of COVID. It, there's a lot of excitement around it and a buzz around what what's possible, and I don't feel that that has really been there. Um, for most of the last 15 years. So I think there is room for positivity. Um, and on that front, we're going, going into another question on, uh, this one's actually on offsetting. So from another joke, different joke, is offsetting actually effective or should we be wary of companies who call themselves green, but when you dig deeper, they're simply spreading money around? Who, uh, yeah, so maybe we can, uh, Brittany or Lubo probably uh, could start us off with this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the, the greenwashing topic because I think part of, of active giving is actually supported by different companies are specifically looking to communicate the fact that they are doing something sustainable. And this is by contributing to tree planting projects. Um, and the idea is like, oh, hey, let's, let's offset and let's communicate um, at its core. And so I think a lot of times, especially within this the climate community that can be seen as greenwashing or as an easy out for a lot of organizations. Um, however, I think that one, it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction. And two, the communication um, around offsetting is still necessary in order to kind of create this larger commitment towards eco-conscious behavior and towards action. So it's not just about implementing um, an action plan to make a company more sustainable, and then carrying out that action plan by investing in the technologies to enable that, um, but also communicating that success. You know, it's important for the champions within an organization to be able to communicate that they hit their targets. Um, and it's important for everyone to know that an organization is actually um, taking more of an eco-conscious approach towards their business. And so while offsetting can, um, I've heard it's, it's a very, let's say, 
cutthroat industry um, and it is difficult uh, to or we're still in the process of figuring out a coherent standard um, to actually you know measure all of the different types of offsets and and you know have different uh, whether it be an ESG index or whether it be a specific uh, organization that has claimed their offsets kind of have a consistent unit of measurement in which people can identify what environmental impact actually is um, that needs to be sorted out but at the same time, I think it's important that organizations kind of take that first step into actually committing to offsetting. Um, and additionally, I think that carbon as well, uh, it's a good unit of metric that everyone is, is starting with more or less and will be integrated into everyone's, um, you know, the same way that we understand how many calories that we eat roughly on, on the day. I think carbon will actually come into play in that measurement as well. Um, and this, this all kind of begins with that. Uh, ecosystem or that market for offsetting that we're currently operating under. Mm -hmm. And tech surely has a huge role here. Um, I can give the example from my company. We're involved in verifying um, off offsets of, of gas emissions, uh, methane emissions, and the, the current systems aren't very accurate. They're, they're tech light. And when you introduce tech into the picture, you can be more accurate and you can you can show evidence, and I think that's really important. So, what what do you think the best in terms of offsetting for tree planting? What do you think is a gold standard? Yeah, I, so it's definitely the maintenance. If an organization is going to count a tree as an offset, that tree needs to stay alive for the 20 years that it's predicted to stay alive. Um, and those 48 pounds of carbon are actually gonna be sequestered from the environment as opposed to um, you know, someone maintaining or creating a, a small project and then kind of walking up and saying, look, my job is done. Um, that's definitely, I think one of the biggest struggles and, and we partner with different organizations. So I can't claim to be 100% of a land use expert on tree planting, um, but I know that the maintenance is extremely important when it comes to actually ensuring those offsets. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, would would uh, Luba Miller or Lawrence like to add anything on, on the topic of offsets? Well, to stir up a little fight, uh, I guess I can say a bit more about my opinion on offsetting. I'm not so straightforward about uh, actually how good it is because there's a lot. So for those of you that are familiar or not so familiar with the topic, offsetting or a ton, uh, of CO2 uh, and basically an offsetting credit that compensates a ton of CO2 can vary between one year up until 1,000 years, just on average. Um, the market is incredibly commoditized. There's a lot of resellers and uh, the resellers take a cut on the way to the money getting to the impact uh, owner, impact creator and so on. Uh, so from an offsetting project to another offset, from one pro offsetting project to another, there's a massive difference. And we need to be really wary when someone claims carbon neutrality overnight um, or when uh, they all of a sudden are saying that they have offset their existence for, uh, for, the, for the whole, uh, maybe since their founding. Uh, in terms of, first of all, did they calculate their scope three uh, emissions? So... Um, I don't know how technical I can get here, but like scope one, two, and three. Yeah, I think it's worth just briefly. Scope one is direct emissions, scope two, indirect, and scope three is supply chain. Is that is that correct? Roughly? Roughly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah, go we, on that basis. We, we're in an audience of scientists, so I, I yeah. never allow myself to say it, it's fully. But uh, what this means is that we basically need to have a deep understanding of how this the calculation was done, was it correctly, and then question every single time when someone, claim, someone claims carbon neutrality. Uh, I know the projects that uh, Brittany works with and I know the fantastic work they do, but I can definitely um, think of many examples where offsetting was not so successful. Uh, also, uh, and most importantly, what our planet needs is reduction of CO2 emissions, not compensation. Companies need to first learn how to become more sustainable themselves um, because we're just on track to hit like three to four degrees uh, increase of temperature and we cannot survive this. Well, there's, there are several more questions coming in about carbon credits and offsetting. So it's obviously a hot topic. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, take Lawrence's uh, take on this as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, Amber, yeah, well, I worked on, we worked to try and reform the European emissions trading scheme, which was the, the sort of first and largest um, 
mandatory carbon market, like it's 60% of the EU emissions. So all of the major sectors, industry, steel, cement, mineral oil, plastics, they had to buy um, the carbon permits for every ton of CO2. So, you know, so that was like a cap and trade system. So it wasn't that they were offsetting, they were getting permits that they had to surrender. Um, and it was it was really important, and it, it you know put a ceiling on the emissions sector and squeezed it all the time. And uh, then it sort of had a bit of a bad patch, and now it's sort of come good again, and it's helped to squeeze coal off the system in Europe. One really a bad thing that happened with offsets in that market. So this isn't this isn't like voluntary market. This is um, mandatory compliance. Was that uh, international emissions uh, offset emissions called um, through the CDM, which is called the Clean Development Mechanism, were allowed in from like the rest of the world so that you could have an offsetting project, you could get the credits from it and then you could sell it into Europe. And that basically crashed the market and later studies found that about 85% of those uh, offsets like weren't really additional. They would have happened anyway. So I've, I have a, some doubt just because of that historical um, difficulties that the offsets have presented. And I also feel that net zero is really the right way to think about this. And you know, within 20 years, we have to go to, to nothing. So if you're saying, oh, I'm gonna offset you know, our transport or something like that, it's like, well, you know, we can, you can turn your transport, you can decarbonize your transport without offsets. Everything you can decarbonize without offsets, you need to do that sooner or later. You can't just offset it. And then there are some things that are really difficult, like international flights. So, you know, can you have more video conferences? Can you work remotely? And then, okay, if you have to make some international flights, fine, then you can offset them in the most uh, effective, you know, bulletproof, proven way that you can. But for everything else, you know, try try not to. So I see it as more of a rather than the sort of first step. Interesting. Well, thanks a lot for that, Lawrence. Um, we're going to move on to a question from Graham, which is for all the panelists. And it's, I would like to know whether they, whether the panelists feel that the biggest challenge is to change adults' opinions and perceptions and actions, or whether we should try to be build, build knowledge and understanding in young people so that they can lead the change. He says, I'm a big advocate of using data to, to support this change and we could incorporate this into education models. So the precy of that question is, are adults leading or are we relying on kids? I, Brittany, I mean, I, I, sorry, sorry. go for it. Yeah, Brittany, start, start us off. <laughs> I think it needs to be everyone at this point. Um, so as you know, major consumers, adults definitely have the biggest influence in terms of purchasing power. And I would say decision-making power that would affect how larger, you know, whether it be government policy um, or whether, you know, different companies actually sell products that are inherently more sustainable in their development. So because adults are the ones that are, are spending the money at the moment and making the decisions within, within their daily uh, jobs, it's definitely a role for everyone to play on top of, of course, education for a future generation that can hopefully set habits from the beginning um, that take sustainability into mind. So we see you know, a trend in, in companies and especially startups, whether it be fintechs like Tomorrow Bank, for instance, um, or different companies that are now officially being marked as public benefit corporations, where this concept of social and environmental purpose is integrated with profit one-on-one. -on -one. So there is no separation. One doesn't sacrifice the other. It's not about having to give up profit because there's a, a more sustainable product running in the background. It's the fact that the company is more profitable because it takes sustainability into consideration. And the more those um, businesses get developed, the more chance there is for everyone uh, who is you know, entering the workforce at one point or another to kind of be integrated into um, an ecosystem and a culture that takes sustainability in mind from the ground up. And then I think that's really the goal in order to affect change is that there's, we shouldn't have be having this discussion really in let's say 20 years when we hit our targets. Um, it should rather just be a way of life. So that's my take. I like that. And I think we're going to move on because we've got still, we've only got six minutes left and quite a few questions. Um, a quick, another one for you, Brittany, quick one. Should we be using the words climate crisis rather than climate change or global warming now? Yeah, I definitely think we're at a crisis um, point because if, like I had mentioned earlier, like 6.4 gigatons from the energy industry alone, and that's not any new emissions that are emitted, like that is huge um so that yeah it's hard to really fully understand uh the level that we're at if we want to um, make any progress so yeah, quick answer 
And I'm going to direct this next one from Jeffrey, Jeffrey P uh, to Lawrence. And Lawrence with a consultancy named Future Energy Associates. You should be good for this one. During the lockdown in March, there was a substantial drop off in energy consumption, yet global warming continues regardless. We need considerable time to substantially reduce carbon pollution to reduce global warming. Our lives really have to change radically. Is this even, is this really possible? Yeah, I, great question. And I mean, like the, the fact that global warming just, just keeps going is because, you know, we have increased the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So, you know, so when we were born, it was what, 350, 60, 70, 80, whatever. And now it's 410 parts per million and climbing, you know, because we've changed this concentration, that's going to keep heating up the planet, um, which is why, yeah, it's you know, all of the stuff that's built now will continue to spew out pollution. So, yeah change like right now and the adults definitely have to make the change they are in charge and you know sorry just think back to that question Greta Thunberg is saying to everyone you know the adults have failed why am I here I should be in school you know like the adults need to make the change is it is it practical like is it feasible yes I mean I am hopeful um we've lived through loads of like massive transitions and these have happened in the past like we went from you know burning uh, charcoal to burning coal we went from like coal to gas or you know town gas to natural gas and these sorts of big energy transitions can happen the difference is that they now have to happen really fast um, but I think look at the scale again look at the look at the scale of the internet and the, the speed of change around some bits of technology I think that shows that we things can change really fast if you get the incentives right if you have the enabling environment and the political will um, and like in the UK we went from yeah 40% coal electricity generation to basically zero in like the last five years, the last five, six years, which is, you know, pretty crazy. I mean, at the, you know, five years ago, no one was thinking that was possible. In the UK, people used to say, if the, if we get to 20% wind power, the national grid will fall over, you know, and it will just break. Yeah. And that turned out to not be true. And I think we'll continue to see these things not be true. Um, yeah, that doesn't mean there's not huge challenges, but I think we are gathering this huge amount of will, and that's part of the building these communities and getting these companies and this change of consciousness that, that the others have talked about. But I, I think it's, it's possible. But yeah, we shouldn't understate the scale of the challenge. Excellent. That was a, a lovely answer. Um, so we've, we've got two minutes left. So I'm going to take one more question and I want 30 seconds from each panelist in response. Brittany, starting with Brittany, then Lubo Miller, then Lawrence. So this is from Joe. I think that's our third Joe, by the way. The sheer scale of the climate crisis can feel overwhelming. How do you stay hopeful day to day, Brittany? How do I stay hopeful? Um, there's a sufficient amount of denial, <laughs> like just stuffing away um, really the, the phase that we're at. Um, and also I just break it down like, I just do what I can on a daily basis, do what we can with what we have and keep moving forward because that's all we're capable of, so. Yeah, that's it. Great. And just before we go to uh, Lubo, we there is the conversation will continue on Slack, and I also ask the the, part, the the panelists if you can answer any questions that haven't already been answered by text. That would be great, so people can get their questions answered. So over to you, Lubo. How do you feel? How do you stay positive? I have two sources of uh, joy. One is the companies we work with, and then the other one is the members of the Green Tech Alliance. Uh, on one side, it's companies that are actually moving the way uh, forward in terms of uh, developing sustainable uh, programs within their own companies. And then on the other side is actually the solutions. And we received over 2000 applications within short six months of time. And uh, that shows that there's a lot of work that is being put on daily basis in the topic. So um, that, that's what keeps me hopeful and happy and excited. Fantastic. Lawrence, I think you've got a few seconds and then we're going to get cut off. Yeah, yeah, it's about the community. I mean, it's 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 finding like minded people who share your beliefs, who, you know, you can seek support from them and you can offer them support when you need it. And the feeling that we're going to get through it together. And I definitely found uh, years ago, I joined some like youth campaigning organizations and having that sort of optimistic view that, you know, this is how things are going to change. Uh, that's that's sustaining because, yeah, you can't sort of battle through it alone. I mean, it's uh, it's scary. And uh, yeah, we have to get through it together. Well, there we are. We managed on time. <laughs> I, I, I want to thank everyone, thank the panelists. Thank you all for joining. There was, um, there was quite a number of people and um, obviously to the Data Science Festival uh, team as well for organizing this and doing everything they've done this year to have this event online. Um, and that 
is it. So we will be okay. continuing the chat on, on Slack. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for moderating. Great job. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.